Good morning, everyone. So earlier, I think it was on Sunday, I put out a list of everything we were going to be talking about this particular week. And originally today was supposed to be a, a study on, um, you, you know what, um, that, that verse, I think it's Romans 3.21 that says something in regards to uh, we uphold the law by faith. I was going to dive into that a little bit more. But this morning when I was I was putting together my notes on that, just the pieces of it weren't coming together. You know, you ever had a study like that where you're working on something and you, you have it in your head, but you just, I don't know, when I'm, I'm trying to put it on paper, it just, it wasn't flowing. And I was looking at it and I was like, I think this is, this is bigger, actually. This might be something I need to spend some more time on. So I'm going to put that on hold. And actually, I'm um, going to talk about something completely different today, but I, th I think you guys will find it very interesting. Uh, this is actually uh, a reel that, that Manuel uh, sent me uh, a couple days ago, but I finally got a chance to, to watch it. And it's about uh, Revelation. It's about the Mark of the Beast. And this particular teacher's interpretation of this, and he's kind of equivalating the Mark of the Beast to sin. If, if you're sinning, then you already have been marked by the Beast, kind of along those lines. So what I did was, as I transcribed it. So I, I just went and I, I typed out everything he said on there. And I thought we could just go through this uh, line by line and then compare it to some scripture and see, you know, is this, is this accurate? Is this, is this a good interpretation? Is this something that we should really, really take to heart? So I think it's going to be fun. Uh, so let's, let's jump right in. So I'm going to read um, line by line here, just starting here at the top. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, it's really short, so I'll read you the whole thing, and then we'll go through it line by line and break it up. That way you just get the whole idea right, right out of the gates here, okay? Revelation 13 speaks of people who will bow to the beast and take a mark, or its number, or a name. <clears throat> what is this mark? Is it an RFID chip or a barcode? I don't know. But the Bible says to, to understand this requires wisdom. I, I actually mistranscribed that. He says the Lord. Um, the Lord says to understand this uh, requires uh, wisdom. What if I told you that the mark is not what you think? What if I told you that the mark was idolatry? What if I told you that the mark was holding hands with sin and not pursuing holiness, being in this world and being of it? The Old Testament speaks a lot about the right hand and the forehead. That's the same right hand and forehead that is mentioned in Revelation. Um, Deuteronomy speaks of these commandments that the Lord gives us, and they are to be on our hearts, and we are to diligently teach them to our children. Then what does it say? We are to tie them as reminders on our hands and bind them on our foreheads. In the Old Testament, the forehead represents ideology. It's what we believe. Our hands represent our behavior. What we believe is made manifest in our behavior. Friends, when you're marked by the beast, you believe in the world system, and your life represents that. When you are sealed by God, you believe in his ways, and therefore your life represents that. What if this mark was simply holding hands with the world? Maybe I'm wrong, but what if I'm not? Okay, so there we are. So there's some things in there. there there's some stuff to unpack there. You know, first of all, I, I did watch uh, a couple other videos by by this person to kind of just gauge him a little bit. And I, I'd really have to watch quite a bit more by him to really get an accurate um, idea of, of what kind of teachings these are. But I, you know... This is somebody who probably is, is their, their heart is probably in the right place. They're probably very, very passionate about, um, about, about Christianity, about Jesus. They're probably, he's probably like that. So definitely not going to sit in judgment of him. He just doesn't, he, he, it's like, it, it kind of is like what we see in church. You know, it's, it's like doing a book report, but not reading the book, which I was the king of doing in high school. I do reports, I, you know, just scan the book and then I'd, I'd write something out. And sometimes I got away with it. Other times I didn't. Um, but I could always get away with it if the teacher wasn't familiar with the book, which from in rare occasions that would happen. I would actually get away with this, you know, loosely, loosely, loosely based interpretation. Um, and that's kind of what this is. It's, it's the book report without reading the book. And, you know, this, this, I think this video got like, gosh, what was it? Like maybe 400 likes. It was quite a bit, like, you know, a lot of amens, things like that. Um, you can get away with it if your audience isn't familiar with, with the, the texts, then, then I think you can pull something like this off. But I thought just for our own edification, let's, let's break this down a lot because there's, there's some statements that are made here. So, okay. So first of all, he's hundred percent correct the way he opens this. Revelation 13 does speak of people who will bow to a beast and take its mark or number. It does speak of that. Um, you know, as far as what is it going to be? Is it an RFID chip or a barcode? I, I really doubt it's, it's probably symbolic. I, I really doubt it's actually um, 
like something, I, I don't know. I, I really struggle to believe that it's actually something like that, but it could be, it could be, you know, it's not rule it out, but probably not. Um, he says, I don't know, but the Lord says to understand this requires wisdom. It requires a great deal of wisdom to understand this. Okay. Um, I don't know, to be honest with you guys, and I, I don't know if I'm splitting hairs here, okay? So correct me if I'm wrong. That statement kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit um, because I kind of got the impression, this is just me, that he was setting himself up as somebody who had this great wisdom, but he ends by saying I could be wrong. So maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's like some humility in there too. I don't know. But it, it kind of did. It just it was one of those things that kind of just rubbed me the wrong way. But I digress. Um, he says, okay, what if I told you that the mark is not what you think? What if I told you that the mark was idolatry? Well, I think the mark is definitely not what we think. I, I would imagine that he's correct with that. It's, it's not what we think. But as far as it, is it idolatry? And he's going he's gonna to actually equivalent that is to being in the world and being of the world and things that Christians are not. And he's going to say Christians are idolaters. So um, what if I told you the mark was holding hands with sin and not pursuing holiness? Holding hands with sin and not per pursuing holiness. Um, what do you mean by that? I guess would, would be my question on that. What do you mean by, by holding hands with sin and not pursuing holy, holiness? We don't see that in the New Testament. As far as pursuing holiness, we, we see a semblance of that depending on your version. But it's, that is actually talking about your actions and attitudes. Um, kind of like how Peter says, uh, be holy, therefore, as, as, um, as I am holy. Uh, it's not, it's not behave so you can become holy. It's behave better because you already are holy. You know, it's, it's lining your, your behavior, your actions, your attitudes up with who you already are. Um, that's, that's how the New Testament presents that because you have been made holy. You've been sanctified. To sanctify means to make holy. Uh, that happened. That happened already. That It only comes by way of blood. You know, the Old Testament models that uh, beautifully for us. Holiness is only ever achieved by the shedding of blood. That's the only way. Uh, it's definitely not by behaving better. That's, you know, you, you start you start like, you know, well, I'm going to be a nicer person. I'm going to be a, a nicer person today, and then eventually I'm going to reach holiness. Uh, no, 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 no. Blood has to be shed on your behalf. And really, for true holiness... It actually had to be the blood of Christ, and the Old Testament models that for us, too. You could get a semblance of this by way of animal blood. You could, uh, but not really. It was basically just a shadow of a reality that was coming. It was to set that up and to show that holiness is a transferable. For one thing, holiness is transferable, um, and that's what's happened with us. We actually have Christ's holiness has been transferred to us. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is that... Um, it comes by blood. It has to be by blood. It has to be. So so as far as I think the way he's using this, where he's saying, you know, what if you're holding hands with sin and not pursuing holiness? We are holy um, and we don't hold hands with sin. We're dead to sin, actually. We're dead to sin and we're alive to God in, in Christ Jesus. So I'll do you one better. Not only are we not holding hands with it, we've actually died to it. So, uh, you know, and that's something that we don't, um, we don't talk about that. You know, we don't talk about that we died to sin. And we really need to start, I think, because if, if, we, um, if we would focus a little bit on that, a lot of these strange teachings, uh, they don't work when, when we understand Christianity is actually a death, burial, and a resurrection, which is how the New Testament lays it out. Romans chapter 6 uh, talks about that. Galatians chapter 2 talks about that uh, in, in various other places. Uh, we'll, we'll mention that. But that's, that's what, what happens when, when we're saved. We die. We are buried with Christ and we're raised a new creation. Actually, Ephesians chapter 4 says the new creation has been created to be like God in holiness and righteousness of the truth. Um, we're created, we're like God. You know, we're, we're like him. In this world, we are like Jesus. So, so I don't like that statement. You know, uh, what if you're holding hands with sin and you're not pursuing holiness? It, we don't hold hands with sin. So that one I have to reject completely. We, we don't, we're, we're separated from that. Um, we're in Christ and in him there's no sin. So scripture doesn't support that. But... Uh, pursuing holiness, like I said, you you could say that there's some semblance of that um, if that is re being renewed by, you know, in your mind, by the Spirit, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. But it would be holiness in your actions and your attitudes. It would not be you are becoming more holy or you're becoming holy. Maybe you're not holy now and you're going to become. Uh, no, that's that's just you can't you can't you cannot make the New Testament say that that's um, that is all extra biblical. So, okay, um, so then he says this. He says, being in this world and being of it. Uh, is that possible? So we're in this world. We are in this world. And we, we need to kind of reference John chapter 17 here, okay? And Jesus says, they are not of this world in the same way I am not of this world. 
That is an absolute statement about the chosen. Well, it's, I think specifically when he was saying that he's talking about his disciples, but this is going to be an absolute statement for anyone who is who is in Christ, the um, the children of God. We are not in this world. Uh, we are not of this world, pardon, um, just as he is not of this world. We are in this world. Jesus says, and my prayer is not that you take them out of this world. So we're not, we're not, we're in the world, you know, it's, but um, we're not of it. And we can't become of it. It's not, when we're in Christ, there's nothing we can do that is suddenly, okay, well, now you're of the world. Uh, no, you're not. You're in this world. You are like Jesus. And what do we know about Jesus? He is not of the world. He's not. And you are not of the world. So this is never anything we can threaten a child of God with here and say, oh, well, you know, some worldly behavior. Now you're becoming of the world or, you know, come, I mean, come on. We, we don't have anything like that in, uh, in the New Testament. So we have the opposite of that, actually. That's tough. You know, when, when you're kind of pushing a, a Faith Plus Works and a, um, a performance-based gospel, you know, uh, do this to be, to be this, do this to be accepted, um, whatever it's going to look like. Verses like that, like what you have in John 17, and really the entire New Testament is honestly a giant inconvenience if you're if you're trying to push that, which is why you have to go to the old, and you have to you have to take largely you have to borrow heavily from Judaism, and then intermingle some Jesus into it to create a doctrine that way, because uh, the New Testament's pretty inconvenient for that. Um, but but yeah, I mean, so th that that's I think that. When you kind of get in that mindset, that faith plus works, do this to achieve that, you know, you, you kind of get in that, um, you're pretty much going to read scripture that way. And I, I don't know how you get around stuff that says the exact opposite of what you're teaching. You're redefining it, obviously, or you're not reading it at all. That's all I can think of there. Because if you're making a claim that Christians can be of the world, you're not familiar with John 17. And if you are familiar with it and you're still saying that, then you don't understand John 17 or really the gospel at all. Um, so, so it, it, that, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm at a loss with stuff like that, how, how, how those kind of missteps are made. But we're going to have uh, actually a few more here as we go. So, okay. Um, so he says this. This is the line we just um, dissected here. So I'm going to read it one more time just for, so we kind of remember it. Uh, he says, uh, what if I told you that the mark was holding hands with sin and not pursuing holiness, being in this world and not in um, being of it, being both in the world and of it? All right. Uh, the Old Testament speaks a lot about the right hand in the forehead. That is the same right hand and forehead mentioned in Revelation. I appreciate that, incidentally. I, I actually do. When, I, when I, I read that, I was like, I do appreciate the connection you're trying to make there. Incorrectly, in my opinion, but... I, I, I like I like that you're using old and new. I don't know. I appreciated that. And like at least there's there there is some some depth to this, uh, but I don't know if the interpretation was quite correct, but there was some depth to it. So he's saying, look, there's a parallel here. You have Revelation speaking about the forehead in the in the right hand and Deuteronomy speaking of it, okay? But here's where we kind of go a little wayward with our interpretation here. Um <clears throat> Deuteronomy speaks of these commandments that the Lord gives us. They are to be on our hearts, and we are to teach them diligently to our children. Um, does Deuteronomy say that to us, the children of God? Does it, does it talk about these commandments that the Lord has given us, and we are to teach them, they're to be on our hearts, and we're to teach them to our children? Let's actually look at that. Um, is it, he's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's uh, very uh, popular. I think, I think this is something that gets really quoted heavily in Christian merchandise and, and things like that. But let's read the first verse of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this is setting up what's going to follow it, which is the scripture he's quoting. These are the commandments, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commandments that I give you so that you may enjoy a long life. All right, are we crossing the Jordan River to possess the land of Canaan? Um, and, or do we just even descend from these people at all, these people that this is being spoken to? And I'm going to have to go with no on that. At least I don't. I mean, I don't let the Hebrew name uh, confuse you here. I, I, my name might be Jeremiah, but there's not a trace of Hebrew in me. So, uh, you know, so, so are, are, is this us? I mean, is this us? Is, do we keep all the laws, decrees, and commandments? Because, again, it's not our favorite parts. It's all of it. And that's what Moses is saying here. This is all of the law that you have to keep. And if you keep it, incidentally, things will go well for you in the land across the Jordan River that you're about to possess. 
um, taking that and copying and pasting that and saying that, oh, and that's just like that today. Um, but now you have to keep all the commands. Well, you have to keep the certain commands and decrees and laws, and then things will go well for you. That's faith plus works, and that's actually an anti-gospel, if, if we're going to take that and, 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 and put that into Christianity, because that is exactly what the Galatians were doing. They began by means of the Spirit, but they sought justification by means of the flesh. That's the same thing that it would, we would be doing if we were going to grab Deuteronomy 6 and we're going to put it in the New Covenant. We're going to put it in the New Covenant and we're going to say that that's, really, we just need to change some of the details, but honestly, this whole thing works. Uh, no. No, that's not that's not what that is. But uh, uh, going down here a little bit is kind of where this is the scripture he's referencing. He doesn't specifically quote it in um, in this video, but this is what he means. Uh, this is verse six, Deuteronomy six six. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your heart. Impress them onto your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you lo- walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads, hands and foreheads, right there. Uh, write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. I, I guess my question would be, you know, if, if somebody's Deuteronomy 6-6-ing six, uh, uh, you, you might ask them, um, are you doing that? Are, are you writing the commandments? And incidentally, the entire law, again, on your door frames, are you, are you, are you, are you, you know, because some of the, the, um, the people who take, the, the Jewish people who take a literal interpretation of this, they actually have little boxes that they, they wear like a headband. They'll have a little box and there'll be little, um, little bits of the law in there, and they'll, they will tie them to their wrists. Uh, they, they actually do do that. Um, but I would ask this person if he's doing that, because you're telling me I need to do that. And if I don't do that, I'm of the world, and I'm, I'm in the world, and I'm, I'm of it, and I'm holding hands with sin. But I don't see you doing that, um, person who's kind of supposed to be the example of this. So, And I, I'm going to have to see all of the law being observed, too, not just, not just part of it, all of it. So um, actually, isn't it... Um, it, it's actually two chapters back here in Deuteronomy where it, it actually says that, that, you know, do not add or subtract. And then we kind of move into this, keeping in mind that Deuteronomy is a single body of instructions. Uh, so, so you know, again, we're, we're picking. We're picking from the buffet here, the parts that we like. So, you know, I, this, this whole thing, I think, just gets really, really um, blown out of proportion, Deuteronomy 6. So I wanted to actually, I have a stack of uh, things over here that I wanted to share with you <laughs> this morning. I wanted to read um, an excerpt from a devotional that has actually uses Deuteronomy six and um, talks about this, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this as well. Um, this is kind of a common interpretation of, of Deuteronomy six, Deuteronomy in, in its entirety almost. So this devotional, it's it's really short. It's just um, it's just like you know a page and a half, and then they want you to reflect on it. That's kind of how these type of devotionals go, but. Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, these words that I'm giving you today are to be on your heart. He left a lot of it out, but we're just going to focus on that. This is what he says. I've been alarmed by a recent series of surveys showing the rep- the rapid, um, the rapidness, I guess, <laughs> of spiritual decline in the Western world. Only 35% of American congregations now describe themselves as spiritually vital and alive. Southern Baptists say if the current trend continues in their denomination, their churches will be reduced by um, by half, by 50%, by 2050. It's probably actually a lot worse than that now. This book was from 2010. And I think that if if we think back 13 years of the world of 2010, that's the year I graduated high school, thinking, thinking back to that year and then think of 2023, I can't imagine that these statistics are still accurate. It's got to be so much worse. They're saying, well, by 2050, we'll be reduced by half. How about by 2025? Because that's probably more or less what it's really going to be. Um, so in England, uh, they're expected to de- decline to the same church by 90% by 2050. Um, other surveys have found the percentage of people claiming no religion has risen in every state in America, and the number of Americans who claim to be Christians is rapidly decreasing. Headlines warn of the coming collapse of, of evangelical Christianity in America. Okay. Uh, so he, he's saying, he's setting all this up, and he's saying, look, there's, you know, the, the people are leaving the church, uh, you know, left and right. There, there's, there's mass exodus going on in the church. We know this. This, again, is 2010. This is so much worse now. This is so much bigger now than it was uh, 13 years ago, as far as the exodus of the churches um, goes. So uh, he says, uh, most the most alarming statistics involve teenagers and young adults. Masses of them are leaving the church after high school, and only a tiny percentage of them return in a regular and sustained way. 
I believe Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, is the most vital parenting passage in the Bible. If followed, it has the power to reverse those statistics. This passage gives us three golden rules for rearing children. Uh, the first one is he quotes one of the greatest commandments, which is um, wrapped up in there. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. The second one is his word must always be on your heart. Um, we must love God's word and read it daily. It's important um, to do that. And then he goes on here and he says, we need to always be talking to our children all the time. Um, we need to be talking to them and pressing this on their minds, kind of like what you see in Deuteronomy 6. So he's basically saying that, look, the church is falling apart. It's in shambles. It's going to hell in a handbasket. And the way that we reverse this is by following the model in Deuteronomy 6. But see, what's so fascinating about that is, first of all, that's not going to do it. Uh, you know, try, trying to tell your children, we need to memorize more. You need to be, read your Bible more. That's probably going to have the opposite effect, especially if you don't lead by example. If you lead by example, and, and I think that you have that relationship with your child, then then maybe. Um, but, but doing it as a, you must, you have to, this is expected of you, I think pretty much always sets a child up to rebel against that. That's just, that's just how, that's just, that's just how we're wired. You know, we don't like that. We don't, <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not inclined to that, uh, especially when it's the law. I mean, and I think that really, you know, if we are actually going to teach Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 6 accurately, this is about the law. This isn't about the New Testament. This isn't about whatever we want it to be. Um, it's actually about the law. It's specifically about memorizing the commandments of the law, but you know, context and all that. I wanted to point something else out uh, before we move on a little bit here. So, you know, we, we like that. We like Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. I wanted to point this out, though. Do you know that Hebrews chapter 8 actually spells out a reversal of that? So we're so focused on we need, we must, we must, we must, we have to, we have to, we have to. Um, we need to do this. Um, so interestingly enough, in Hebrews chapter 8, when it talks about the new covenant, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant, declares the Lord. It's actually completely different. He says here in um, verse, starting in verse 10, he says, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And here's where you actually see a backpedaling of what you had in Deuteronomy. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And then really to put a bow on that, the next verse says, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one, Deuteronomy 4, 6, or Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 6, obsolete. He's made that obsolete and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So there's a new system here. It isn't about trying to impress this information into people's heads over and over and over again. That's actually what you would do that makes sense for the Old Testament because there's been no change with this person. They still have the sinful heart. You know, all the Old Testament Jews are like this because there's no new creation. They're all old creation. They're all dead in Adam. So they all have the, the wicked heart. They all have that. They have the, the corrupt spirit. Um, they're the enemies of God. They're bent in the wrong direction, away from God. Every inclination of the human heart is actually wicked and evil. That's what um, every, from childhood, that's what God says in Genesis chapter 6. That's their situation in the Old Testament. That's not our situation. That's their situation in the Old Testament. So that makes a ton of sense that you would really want to be impressing this law onto them all the time. You know, always be in the law, always be memorizing the law. Metaphorically, write it on your forehead and on the palms of your hands. Basically just saying, you know, write it on your doorposts. Always be engrossed in this because really you're you're kind of steered in the opposite direction. Um, you know, that's that's not, righteousness is not who they were. In the Old Testament times, it's not. Righteousness is who we are under the new covenant. And that's why, incidentally, you have a reversal of this. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. It's completely different. So that's the scripture we have. And that's really where I'd want to stick with that. Um, going back to the law and saying, well, if we just get our, our children back in the law, then um, somehow we're going to stop this church decline. No, you're not. You're going to cause it. That's going to cause more of it. Um, uh, you know, it really being in, in, uh, in that in that mindset, this performance-based religious mindset, that's going to cause the exodus. I think that that's really what's caused it largely. There's been some other things, but really that, that legalistic um, 
those legalistic teachings and, and that, that faith plus works is performance. You're not good enough. You're not doing enough. You're not being enough. Uh, guilt, fear, shame, all those things is what has caused that exodus. So he's saying, we need to turn up the juice on this, guys. We need, we need to do more. You're not doing enough. And he's kind of saying it now to the parents. He say, it's your fault. You know, um, so uh, it, the, that whole idea is just absolutely broken. Um, but, that, but that's exactly what, you know, this person in, 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 this, uh, in this transcript that we're talking about today, that's exactly what they're doing too. Get back into the law. Get into the law so you can behave better. So, okay, so he says this. I'm going to read that last line again just to kind of, um, because I know some people have joined uh, since we read that, just so everybody knows right where we're at. He says, uh, Deuteronomy speaks of these commandments that the Lord gives us, and they are to be on our hearts, and we are to teach them diligently to our children. Then what does it say? We are to tie them as reminders on our hands and bind them on our foreheads. We just talked about how, of course, that is not talking about the children of God. That's the children of Israel. There's a big difference there, okay? So next line here, he says, and now we're going to kind of enter a different idea here. So he says, in the Old Testament, the forehead represents ideology. It's what we believe. Okay, I read that this morning. The Old Testament, the forehead represents ideology. It's what we believe. No, it doesn't. In fact, I couldn't find, I, I did a, a word search on that because I thought, I'm like, that's wrong. So I, I, I did a, a word search on that. I looked up um, forehead in a few of my um, Bible dictionaries and the word doesn't even show up in, in most Bible dictionaries because and the reason for that is because it just means forehead. That's when it, when it shows up, it, it just means forehead. There's not any symbolism behind that. Um, that's completely fabricated where he's saying that the forehead represents ideology. It's what you believe. That's fine if he believes that, but scripture does not lay that out. That's it's never presented in a symbolic way that this is oh well, yeah. No, it it just isn't. So we've kind of entered the part of this now where it just becomes complete fiction. And unfortunately, that happens a lot. That happens a lot with any and it sometimes I think, unfortunately. You get teachers who kind of prey a little bit on their audience with things like that. And they think that, well, look, I'm the educated pastor here. And if I say the Old Testament, you know, the forehead represents ideology, I can say that. And really nobody's going to question me on that because they're going to they're going to think, well, he, he must know what he's talking about. He's he's the guy who studied the Hebrew and the Greek. And um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of that. There's like predatory teachings like that. But here's the cool thing. We have the tools to check on, on this type of stuff. You know, we can check them on this. Is that is that true? Does does the, does the forehead represent ideology? Well, first of all, in my Bible dictionaries, actually, I got the wrong book here. In my Bible dictionaries, it doesn't even show up at all. The word forehead doesn't show up at all because it only means forehead. There's no reason to have have, have the Hebrew or the, or the Greek version of that because it just means forehead. But I did actually find it in a concordance. It's the only place I could find it was in a concordance because a concordance will actually catalog every single word used in the Old and New Testament. So forehead has to be in here. And uh, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is poth for forehead, and it means forehead. That's what it says here. It says poth, it means forehead. That is it. It is never used in any sort of a symbolic way to mean anything um, besides uh, besides forehead. So what do we do with that? You know, I, I think that that's just that's just his interpretation of it. So I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't find anything like that. Um, so he says the forehead represents ideology. It's what we believe. Um, and then he says this. He says our hands in the Old Testament represent behavior. Okay, they do represent, there are symbolic uses of hands. There, there is symbolic uses of hands in the Old Testament. So um, as far as representing behavior, I couldn't specifically find that, where it was talking about your hands are somehow behavior. I'm not necessarily... I wouldn't necessarily say, well, that's wrong. You know, I wouldn't necessarily say that. But I did want to read you what we do have with, with hands here. And um, we can kind of decide, you guys can kind of decide for yourselves if, if hands would be symbolic of behavior. Um, so this is actually hand, and this is in, this is in Hebrew. And it says, um, the word is yad, um, Y-A-D. And it says, usually refers to a human hand, although occasionally it has different meanings, such as a memorial or monument. Uh, and going down here a little bit, this is talks about all the times it's used as hands, which I don't think we, um, it refers to the wrist or the lower arm. Uh, but anyway, here it is. So there are some symbolic uses of it here. It says, in the Old Testament, the hand is a symbol of authority and control. For an example, the hand of the Lord. Um, that's an, a symbol of authority and control, the hand of the king. 
uh, the king's hand, the Lord's hand was heavy on, on this, this people. That's how that could be used. Um, and uh, it also can represent stewardship and personal responsibility. So, so maybe, you know, maybe it, it, could, it could mean something somebody did. The work of their hands could have been evil. And that could have been, you could kind of chalk that up to, well, that's, that's bad behavior. You know, you could kind of do that. You could kind of make those connections a little bit there. Um, and let's see um, if there's anything else here. Um, okay, to lay hands on someone can mean to arrest or assassinate that person. Um, to give the hand to a person um, or God denotes uh, personal allegiance, to raise a hand uh, to somebody. Um, and it's also used in, in some, other, uh, some other ways, like being shorthanded or short-sighted. Um, it's just, just different, different uses of, of that. So, so you, do have, you do have a semblance of that. So, th so that one in particular, like I said, I wouldn't necessarily just strike that down uh, right out of the gates. Maybe, maybe with that. I don't agree with the way that it's being used here, but, but maybe, maybe. So, okay, so then he says the most true line in all of this. He says, what we believe is manifested, is made manifest, pardon me, in our behavior. Absolutely. So maybe we should teach the gospel because he's, he's, he's trying to like kind of impress law on you and say, you need to do this. You need to not be of the world. Um, you need to really be in Deuteronomy chapter six. Um, you need to, you know, that, that needs to be your model for life is constantly trying to impress the commandments, uh, the laws, the decrees, everything on, on yourself. And that's going to somehow stop you from holding hands with sin and being of the world. Um, but, but, he, but, then, but then he does say that. He says, you know, what we believe is made manifest in our behavior. Uh, so, so preach the gospel. Preach, preach Jesus. Preach grace. And all the things that you're afraid of here, of happening, um, they're, they're going to be like vapor. You know, because, because that's really... I, I, I was never able... You know, I, I grew up under, under both... Uh, well, I grew up under only one, which was the, the mixed message. You know, the, the um, faith plus works, the Jesus plus the law, all of that. And that was never effective to, to, um, for me to stop sinning, you know, you know, cause that's really the goal. That's really the goal of a lot of these sermons is stop sinning, stop sinning, stop sinning, stop sinning, do better, do more. Um, but that doesn't work. That, that doesn't work. You know, that, that, that constant, that guilt, that fear, that shame, uh, that you kind of get spoon fed in, in those kind of teachings, that doesn't work. Um, that causes sin to increase. The law does cause sin to increase. Romans chapter seven says that sinful passions are aroused by the law. At least in Paul's case, that was true. But really, I think that's true in a lot of cases. Uh, the, the law arouses sinful passions. So, you know, so, so this, this is, it's just backwards. It's just, it's just a backwards way of approaching this. But he has the core truth here right. He has this part right. What we believe determines our behavior. Um, so why wouldn't you want to tell the children of God, why wouldn't you want to teach them that they're holy, they're righteous, they're forgiven, they're in Christ, they're justified. They're, they have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't you want to teach them that? Why wouldn't you want to do that? Because if you're concerned about their behavior and you think that if they behave wrongly, they're going to somehow be the mark of the beast, then wouldn't you want to, <laughs> wouldn't you want to equip them with the authentic gospel then? But, you know, I, I think people don't trust it. I just, I, frankly, I, I think they don't trust it. I think they think that's vulnerable, um, that that can be abused. And, you know, we're going to have people sinning like crazy and we have to keep them in line. So they need, they need you know, yes, Jesus for salvation. Yes, to that. You know, we, we all can kind of agree on that, that, you know, Jesus is believing in the Son of God is how you're saved. Um, but we need a system after that because, you know, if, if that's it, then first of all, there's a couple things I think that are fears that jump into their minds. First of all, there's going to be no works. And they, they're very works focused, you know. So first of all, there's going to be zero works after that. Um, and, then, and, then, um, and then next it's going to be, there's going to be a n nothing but sin. It's going to be nothing but sin after that. You know, there's going to be no works and sin like crazy. And um, we can't have that, so we need to have structure. And that's when we get the reintroduction of the law or parts of it or whatever traditions that we like, whatever some theologian said at some point that's now considered to be scripture. You know, and we get, we get all that. We get all those layers um, after that. So, okay, so he, he goes on and he says, friends, uh, when you're marked by the beast, you believe in the world system and your life represents that. As the, as the children of God, we cannot be marked by the beast. Um, we can't, that, that is impossible. There is no amount of bad behavior or anything we could do that would somehow cause us to be marked by the beast. Quite frankly, guys, we don't even know what that means um, to, to be marked by, you know, we don't even know what that is going to look like necessarily. 
But it sure shouldn't be something we're being threatened with as the children of God. It sure shouldn't ever be that. Um, as far as how this is actually going to go, um, I use this example a lot. Prophecy looks different. When, when you have a prophecy laid out and you have a prophecy fulfilled, so you go to the Old Testament, you have a prophecy laid out. A lot of times, sometimes they're fulfilled in the Old Testament, but not, not all the time. But sometimes you have them laid out, and then in the New Testament, you can flip forward and see the fulfillment of that prophecy. Some of them are very literal. Uh, this is a New Testament one, but it, it pops into mind. Jesus saying that when he's in the temple courts, not a single stone will be left on top of the other. Uh, the fulfillment of that was quite literal. In fact, today, if you go to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and on one of the walls, there's actually just a giant pile of what used to be the buildings that were up on the Temple Mount, and there's not a single stone left on top of the other. They were all thrown down exactly the way he said. So sometimes it's extremely literal. Other times, not so much. If we go to the book of Malachi, uh, it actually, God says in the, you know, before, before the, the coming of the Messiah, he's going to send back Elijah the prophet. He's going to send Elijah. But we, we, what we actually get is John the Baptist. But God didn't say he was going to send somebody like Elijah. He said he was going to send Elijah, the prophet. Uh, but, but he didn't necessarily. He sent John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. So that's what I'm saying. So when we actually see the fulfillment of these prophecies, it can look a heck of a lot different than the way that it was laid out originally. That's probably going to be the case with Revelation, with a lot of these things in Revelation. When they do occur, they'll probably look a lot different. They'll be fulfilled, 100% fulfilled but it might not look exactly the way that it's spoken in there. It might, these might've been symbols that were representing something else. And then we don't know what that something else is. So, uh, so uh, going down here, he says, when you are sealed by God, you believe in his ways. Therefore your life represents that. Um, as the children of God, we are sealed. Uh, we are marked with the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit uh, guaranteeing what is to come, guaranteeing our inheritance. We are already sealed. We don't, our behavior doesn't seal us and unseal us like an envelope. Um, we're already sealed. That's done. That's done the moment you believe. Ephesians says that. When you believed, you were marked with a seal, guaranteeing our inheritance. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's a deposit, guaranteeing what's to come. God is saying, I bought that. Uh, just like, you know, that's, I think that's why the word deposit is used. Like if you leave a security deposit on something, you're coming back for that. You, are, you bought that. That's yours. You're showing that you're good on that by leaving, by putting some of the money down. You're showing you're good on that. I'm serious. I'm taking that. That's mine. I bought that. That's what a security deposit is. We've received that. We've been sealed. We've been sealed in the Holy Spirit. So this implication I don't love that, that you know, you can be sealed. And well, now today you're, you're, you have the mark of the beast. Now tomorrow, if you behave better, you'll be sealed. I mean, come on. It's trying to, it's trying to, it's trying to sell us the, the absolute um, that we have in Christ. It's trying to sell us those uh, for, for good behavior. And I, I don't, I, I have, quite frankly, I hate that, uh, to be honest with you guys. I, I, I actually hate that. That's, um, uh, I was going to talk about this a little later in the week. I'm going to mention it now and then I'll get to the comments. Uh, I'll just wrap this up really quickly. You guys remember in Galatians when Paul says that if anyone is teaching any other gospel, let them be cursed. Let them be accursed a, a or, or cursed under God's curse, depending on your translation. Um, I'll say it again. He says, um, if anyone brings to you any other gospel than the one you received, let them be under God's curse. So, this is another gospel, and I kind of had this idea in my head that, you know, and I still do. I, I go back and forth with this, so I haven't really made my mind up with this, but if somebody's preaching faith plus works or whatever form of that that they, they are preaching, let's say that they've added a ton to the gospel message, but the gospel's still authentic. They're still preaching that salvation is found nowhere um, else besides um, in Jesus Christ, besides in the Son of God. When they're preaching that, I kind of listen to them and I, I, I tend to ignore all the other stuff because I'm like, well, they, they have the gospel right. So, you know, I, I don't like the additions. I don't like the expansion packs here, um, but they do have the gospel message right. So, you know, I, I look at that, but I don't really think that was Paul's heart. You know, I think that he was saying, look, if they're bringing a different message, let them be under God's curse. I don't think that that's really they're being cursed by God necessarily. As if they're in Christ, they're not being cursed by God. You know, we, we know that. There's, there's, no cur there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But... A curse can also mean to be cut off. Uh, it, can, it can mean different things, and I, I kind of wonder if that's that's what it means. Just don't listen to them. That just just you know get 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 that out of here. Essentially, just don't listen because they're they're bringing you a different message. So I kind of like I said, I'm kind of going back and forth on that. I don't know if that that should really be like my attitude, where I'm just like you know don't don't even want to hear it. It's a different message, or if it should be more because I think I was really intolerant to stuff like that before. 
and now I kind of like matured. So now I'm like, well, that's I got the gospel right. But then I'm I've been doing this deep study in Galatians, and I'm like, I don't know, maybe maybe I should actually be a little bit more not like screaming at them or anything, not like anything rude or anything like that. But you know, maybe I should be a little bit more okay. Yeah, not gonna listen. You know, then maybe that. Okay, uh, let me jump to the comments. I'm sorry, guys. I know there was a bunch here. Um, I will get to them all. Uh, good morning, David. Uh, Amber says he sounds fearful. He is. It's um, it, yeah. It's it's that when you don't understand the gospel, I think fear is pretty much going to be a key player in all your teachings because we because we think we're the Old Testament Jews. We think we're the Old Testament Israelites, and we don't understand that that's a different situation. So everything that we see there, we, we, we stick ourselves into those scenarios and we say, well, gosh, if I, if I sin too much, God's going to do this, or he's going to do that, or he's going to, you know, he's going to get me this way or get me that way. And we don't understand that those people were in a covenant with God. They agreed to that. First of all, God laid everything out for them in Deuteronomy of this is all the things that are going to happen. If you don't keep these laws, these decrees, these commandments, he laid all that out. Uh, this was not, uh, and they agreed to it. And he said, here's the blessings. The blessings list was a little bit shorter. Here's the blessings that, you know, you can also obtain by, by keeping the law. We never, we are under no such agreement with God. That is not our story. It has never been our story. Uh, so, but when you don't understand that and you think it's all, everything from Genesis to Revelation is 100% speaking of the children of God, you can get a lot of fear that way. Um, it's, it's a bypass again of the son of God. Um, okay. Um, remembering who we are as believers already are. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's like the cross didn't happen. Unfortunately, and I don't know if the context is right on this. Um, I'm going to quote something. Paul says, some live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their God is their stomach. And he's talking a little bit um, about different things. But just that line, and I don't want to use it out of context. So I'm not sure that this would be something we could just say here. But I'm going to say it with that preface. Um, so you're, some are living as enemies of the cross of Christ. Um, could that not be teachings like this that are just really ignoring it, just really ignoring Jesus, really ignoring what he's done? Maybe the person's a believer. We don't know. I mean, they, they could be. Um, but wouldn't teachings like this be enemies of the cross of Christ? Because it's not at all making any any sort of a, a deal out of him. You know, he's 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 to the side. You know, Jesus is, okay, yeah, but that's how we were saved. But now here's all the works and here's all the things we have to do to make ourselves somehow pleasing, to make ourselves more holy um, is what, you know, we were talking about here. So I, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe that's that's something we could say there. Um, Amber says sin conscious instead of Christ conscience, conscious. Sorry. Um, yes, it's all it's, it kind of becomes about sin and it doesn't. Um, Jesus is the afterthought. You know, he's not he's not he's not something that. That matters ultimately. He he's he's just a replacement for the Old Testament sacrifices. Like we we all kind of understood that when you know growing up thinking about church and school, we all kind of understood that that you know this was like a, a final sacrifice. But uh, that's it, that's it. And then then you um you get eternal life by through salvation. It's you're, nothing different with you though. You know you're still you're still the the Old Testament sinner with the sinful nature. Uh, believe in the one uh, sent and love one another is what Manuel says. The two commandments of Christ. Uh, Larry, good morning. Uh, the Hebrew people sure thought it meant forehead. That's why they made, um, I, I don't know how to pronounce that word, but I think if, if, if I'm thinking of what you're talking about, Larry, is this a box that they actually put like a headband, um, kind of thing on and they, and they actually had like little bits of the law on their forehead. I, I saw pictures of that in one of the books I was studying. I, I think that might be that what that word is, um, I'm not going to pronounce, I don't think I'm going to attempt to say it, but I, I think that might be what, what that means. Uh, Joseph Smith comes to mind. He, yeah. Well, yeah, he was, um, you know, I, I think that he had a beautiful career as a um, writer of really colorful fictions. I mean, the guy was extremely creative. If only he had used that for good. You know, if, he, if only he had used that mind for good, because... I mean, he was talented. You know, I, I think that he was somebody who kind of went his whole life looking for purpose and things like that. It was probably that. And he, he found that in, in Mormonism, the, the thing he created. But he, he, he had a career ahead of him as a fantastic author. If he hadn't tried to claim that all these things were, were real and, that, you know, that all that, he could have done, you could have done all kinds of fiction um, about that. That would have been popular. That would have been good. He, he, was, he, he was creative. Um, but unfortunately, you know, he decided that, he was also divine and had received special messages from God and all, all the things that followed after that. 
So uh, maybe he's thinking um, when Jesus was saying, if you do this, um, it'd be better to cut off your hand. Amber says, probably because he he's probably has that mindset. The, the um, this, 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 you know, we need to kind of be engaged in this, this battle against sin um, every single day because uh, we got to, we got to fight the sinful flesh and we have to really try to put on the new man. And um, it, it's just this constant struggle between us and sin. But that, that again, um, that's that's against what that's against the gospel because of course the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world, and um, by one offering He's perfected forever those who are sanctified. So, so it isn't that um, we have already put on the new. So we are the new creation. We can't we don't slip back in you know slip back and forth um, from old creation to new creation. That's that's a man made teaching. Uh, that's not the scripture doesn't support that. Um, so um, by grace new covenant. Good morning. The hand of the Lord is also providing, protecting, and holding us. Amen. Um, the gospel is the clear answer for all of this. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it always is. Um, people get too concerned as if they're going to be the reason somebody changes. If that were the case, somebody else could simply unconvince them. It has to be the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's, I, I suppose so. You're putting that pressure on, on yourself. I can see what you're saying there. You know, they're, they're putting that, that pressure on them that, um, they're going to be the reason that somebody, you know, is, is either, either saved or not saved. And they kind of, they kind of put that on themselves a little bit. We could do a whole live stream about the um, the push for evangelism in our churches. How everybody has to be evangelizing all the time, and um, you know that, that. And I think that's hurt a lot of people too. Probably there's probably so many layers to that cake as to why there is um, you know that mass exodus going on right now in the church. There's probably so many layers to that. Um, but I, I I remember the evangelism. I remember the cold calls and everything. Um, I, I remember all that. That was that was um, that was yeah yeah. We could do a whole stream on that. Um, like if you told me not to sin, it's, it's like being told not to think of the color red. It, and that's, and the thing is when, you know, when, when, when God gave Moses the law, he, he knew that, um, he knew that the law was given. So sin would increase. Um, he knew that was going to be the case, but it really needed to, sin did need to increase. It really needed to be kind of just, just exposed kind of in your face so that people could realize the futility of keeping the law. Also the history of Israel is an excellent testament to that. To the futility of keeping the law. Look at, look at the history. Look what happened to them. Um, look at all those. Look, look at everything. You know, look at just, just life under the law is, is you know, if you look at the history of Israel, like in Kings and Chronicles, um, that's life under the law, and it was not a happy one. Uh, and it's, it's just because it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And it, the problem is actually not with the law. God found fault with the people. The problem was with the people. They had the wicked heart. They were not made new, and because of that. They're not going to be able to, to get anywhere close to, to law abiding. God knew all that. And he had a plan way ahead of time. He had already announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, saying all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. It's way ahead of that. He says that's 430 years before he gives the law to Moses. Um, so he, so he, he's planning on all this. He knows this is going to be a colossal failure. It's, it's going to be. Not because anything was wrong with the law, but because of the people. So, um, Okay. Larry says, we are not our own. We were bought with a price. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. There is no way he will allow anyone else to put their mark on what is his. Absolutely. So we don't need to be afraid of being marked by the beast. I mean, that that is not something scripture presents. That is never for the children of God. Um, that is just downright silly, honestly, that we're, that we're saying something like that. Um, Layers of tradition piling up like sediment. <laughs> That's what happens with wrong teaching over 500 years. Just because pastor says it, it doesn't make it scriptural or true. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but I think we put a lot of stock in people, unfortunately. And so, you know, we can learn a lot from, from our brothers and sisters too. So it's not like, you know, never. And I, I, I struggle with that. Cause like, I actually had just found, this is me, but I had just found a channel on uh, YouTube that I thought was really good. And I was, I was finally like watching this and I was kind of absorbing a lot from it. Um, and I was getting really excited about it. But then, um, when I started fact checking some of it, I realized it wasn't so good, you know? And then I was like, oh, you know, that's, then I was all like angry with myself. I was like, there, that's what I get. You know, that's what I get for, um, for, for, you know, for doing that, for listening to a person. But I, it's, that's not really the right attitude. I mean, we, we can, we can learn a lot from our brother, brothers and sisters, but always testing the spirits, you know, always testing those spirits and making sure that, that, um, what they're saying can actually be found in scripture, that it aligns with what we have in the New Testament. 
Uh, Larry says, as a young pastor, I taught what I had been taught and fought anyone who disagreed. It was a terrible mixture of law and grace with emphasis on the law. Larry, I can't imagine you teaching a mixed message. Um, I, I, I watch, that, that's so hard to picture. It's like a bizarro world. I watch, I watch your videos um, all the time. And um, whenever you put one out, I watch it right away. So I, that, to me, I don't know. That's just like, I, that would be so hard for me to imagine you teaching a mixed message that's focused on the law. So I, I would think that I had entered the twilight zone if I saw something like that. Uh, by grace, new covenant, in this world, we are like him. And living out our new identity, we have um, through Christ in, in, in union with the Holy Spirit. It could be that an unbeliever is, t is touched by that um, God's grace and love. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and that will happen. You know, if living, living in Christ, Christ living through us, that will happen. Um, they, they will recognize that. Um, Jesus says uh, that, that, that we'll be recognized because we love one another. And that's, that's how, that's how the we'll be recognized is because of that. Um, I know I'm going kind of long here, guys. I, I don't want to ignore any of your comments. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of get through these as quickly as possible because um, I don't, I don't want to keep you too much longer here. Um, Amber says, I, I totally understand uh, that, Larry. I did the same thing with my children until I learned that was an error. Um, well, guys, I, you're among friends. Uh, I also did that. I was in, this is teaching like mixed stuff. I was um, really into deliverance ministries and um, uh, just, just kind of like how, because of how I began, uh, you know, uh, being a Christian, I was really involved in that and all the horrible errors that come from that. Oh, I was teaching them. I was writing about them. I was lecturing people about them. I mean, so uh, we've all done it. Um, let's see. Okay. So, all right. Well, thanks so much, guys. Thanks for the conversation. I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, Thanks for, thanks for the talk. Uh, Manuel, thanks for the reel. Uh, that was, I think that, you know, stuff like that, we can all be mutually edified by just by reading through that and running it through scripture. Is that, is that true? Are these statements true? So, um, and uh, tomorrow, I think tomorrow I was going to talk about a little bit, some, some things out of Galatians. So as long as that pans out, as long as the research goes well on that, uh, that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow. So thanks so much, guys. Have a good day and I'll see you soon. Bye.